Well, I am honored today because this is a very special uh, opportunity to learn from a true treasure. We are speaking with Prince Ermius Sali Selassie, Hali Selassie, the president of the Crown Council of Ethiopia. How are you doing? Well, David, it's a pleasure to talk with you and to conduct this interview with you today. Well, very good. And a lot of my audience, they're big history buffs. They like to learn about history, but they also like to know about geopolitics, current events. So we'll go through some of these things together and try to maybe glean some lessons that we can learn along the way. We have a, a really unique time in world history right now. We've had a big pandemic. It's still going on. It's a lot of devastation for countries and economies around the world. And I think if we don't learn from history, of course, we're doomed to repeat the mistakes of history if we don't learn from our past. So I thought that today you and your special relationship and your family could give us some insights into uh, the history of Ethiopia and some of the lessons that we can learn for our time today. Right. Well, you know, Ethiopia is such an old civilization, as you know. Uh, it's it's gone through its own tests. It's it's a remarkably resilient country, and the people are, and there is much to be learned from it. Uh, for me, uh, what has stood foremost in my mind has always been the uh, fortitude of Ethiopians and the very fact that they preserved their independence throughout that period of time because they're people who do not like injustice. I think that's really the key lesson in, 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 my, in my perspective about uh, Ethiopian history. Yes, and I, I wanted for folks who, again, a lot of our listeners, we have listeners in Africa too, but most of our audience is in America. Can you give some, uh, some background on your family for those, for, you know, American history doesn't give us a good understanding of uh, the history of Ethiopia. Your grandfather was Emperor Haile Selassie. Yes. Uh, at Rastafari. Can you give us some insight into those titles and, and his impact? Um, yeah, the emperor is a descendant. Is, he's the 225th successor to the Solomonic line of kings and emperors in Ethiopia, according to the tradition in Kibranagas, which is the basically what was the constitution prior to 1974. Uh, as a young uh, prince, he was called Rastafari. Rastafari, which means, uh, Ras is the title, which means uh, sort of Prince Tafari. So that was his first name. When he became coronated in 1930, he became Emperor Haile Selassie I, which was uh, his baptismal name, and it means the strength of the Trinity. Well, very good. And he, he was a huge figure in liberation of Africa. Can you expand a little bit about that and inform our audience about his, his role in shaping Africa the way we have, uh, you know, remembered his impact today? Well, I think, I think it goes back to what we mentioned earlier about history and how during the, uh, he struggled very hard to get Ethiopia accepted into the League of Nations in the uh, 1920s. And the outbreak of the war with Italy in 1936, the League let him down. So he felt that uh, this experience should not be repeated. So he became a very big advocate of collective security. And as such felt that Ethiopia was so isolated, that's why it paid its price. So. He became a big advocate of the United Nations, uh, the concept behind collective security, and the decolonization of Africa. So Ethiopia being one of the few independent countries led the movement uh, for decolonization, and he became the principal founder of the Organization of African Unity, which now has become the African Union in 1963, and it's still headquartered in Addis Ababa. And, you know, the history has been written sometimes by people who do not portray the facts as they actually were. And one of the things that I've been concerned with in recent years is the rise of neo-Marxists 
trying to act as if they are the uh, defenders of African liberation and so forth. But I think you have a different uh, experience and perspective on that uh, ideology's track record, right? Completely. I, I, I think um, clearly there were different elements, including Marxist elements, during the struggle for African decolonization. But in principle, I think it was the realists who were at the forefront, and they were the ones who were able to achieve the goals outside of ideology and in a pr pragmatic sense to, to create the pace of decolonization in a very realistic way. And as such, uh, certainly there, there were competing forces. Uh, and, you know, people think Africa is one country, but it's a combination of 56 plus nations. So it's very hard to bring all those uh, disparate factors into play. And I think one of the magic and gifts of His Majesty was to bring all these different groups together and be able to at least have a common charter whereby they can all work uh, under. And so what was it like for you growing up, being raised in His Majesty's court, you know, being raised to potentially be an emperor someday or something, you know, what was that well, like? Well, you know, you, 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 you never, you re, when you're going through it, you never realize uh, until you reflect back on it. And uh, for me, of course, uh, I had the child's perspective on, on things, but uh, it was an exciting and uh, privileged time. And looking back in my life, I think it, I'm also very grateful. It was probably the most stable part of my life uh, from age from, from my birth to about 14 years age when the revolution happened. So I remember a lot of family gatherings and, you know, they did the ordinary things, went to school, had friends, uh, were, was able to play with uh, my cousins in the palace uh, with the animals and travel around the country with my grandfather. So I have very, you know, memorable and uh, uh, memories that I treasure from that period. And of course, the emperor was known for his uh, very unique animals, right? And tell those oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, we're very privileged. Uh, you know, not often do you grow up with lions and cheetahs and peacocks and you know, and uh, gorillas. So, as a child, these are the most exciting things in your life. Wow! So you get to hang out with lion cubs. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Not in too close proximity, but yes. And uh, of course, your grandfather, he also had relationships with, uh, you know, many of the folks who were very powerful in America, you know, from Roosevelt and the Kennedys and right. shed some light into those relationships. That... Right. Well, I think after the, after the war, uh, His Majesty's focus uh, was on the United States as, a, you know, the new world. Uh, and he started engaging the United States from the time of President Roosevelt uh, right up to the end uh, uh, in 1974, just before Nixon resigned. So he, comes, he had relationships from Roosevelt onwards right up to President uh, Nixon. And, uh, and, uh... And, you know, was there a particular family that there was a closest bond to, or did it, was it just... I think he, you know, that it, it was very interesting because he, he, had, uh, he had the ability to, to uh, bring people uh, from different ideas together. And uh, he had a relationship, for instance, with Richard Nixon going back when he was vice president to uh, President Eisenhower. And at the same time, he, he forged a very close relationship with President John F. Kennedy. And uh, the start of the Peace Corps in Africa, which was, uh, you know, uh, Kennedy's forefront uh, initiative, the space program. So uh, I think also what people remember him mostly for is also for his uh, attending the funeral of President Kennedy in 1963 when he was at the forefront of the heads of state walking behind the casket. And the reason why that happened was, I believe he was the last 
visiting head of state to be received by by President Kennedy, and it all seemed so surreal to him that this was to occur, say, uh, two or three weeks later. Yeah, and you can see the news archives of that uh, of that uh, appearance. Was, right, it's amazing. right, and he, he kept up the relationship with the family all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Kennedy family inaugurated a library in the university. Um, I think. Uh, uh, Rose Kennedy celebrated her 80th birthday in Addis in the palace. So he did keep up and he, whenever he did come to the United States, he used to visit with the uh, Jacqueline Onassis. And, uh, you know, that relationship uh, continued. And of course the, and then you said you were 14 years old when the revolution occurred, is that correct? Right, right. So how was that for you from your perspective? What happened? I'm still trying to understand its traumatic effects, but to be honest with you, it's like one of those things you never really actually prepare for. So you wake up one day and realize that you're a refugee and you get on with it and learn how to deal with, with, uh, with what life is throwing at you. But uh, certainly I never believed in my life that I would find myself in that predicament. So did, were you in harm's way or were you removed before? I don't know. I always say uh, I've been saved by God's grace. A lot of my family were imprisoned, uh, immediate family. Some were killed. And I happened to be in school in England, uh, just a regular term. So I was able to escape it. So uh, aside from the uh, psychological trauma, I never experienced any other uh, 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 you know, harm. Uh, of course, we were fearful for our lives because we heard at one point that the military government, which was really a Marxist-Leninist government, sent assassins to kill us. So we were always aware of our uh, security. And it reminds me of the Marxist, the, what the Bolsheviks did to the Tsar of Russia with his family, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. I think in that respect, my family had been very lucky. Uh, very few died while in prison. Most of them were released, some after 17 years. And the reason why I think uh, uh, also they survived is because of the political pressures applied, you know, through the speed channels and back channels by the United Kingdom, the United States and the European nations. <laughs> so certainly they, they were very, very fortunate. And what do you, what do you what was the uh, conditions that allowed them to have this striking takeover of, as you have mentioned, a, a dynasty, the Solomonic dynasty, going back thousands and thousands of years? What what allowed this condition to take place? This revolution out of nowhere. Well, I, I think it's a combination of things. One certainly is that um, uh, as education progressed, and this is partly the success of the emperor. Uh, expectations rose. So people wanted to uh, uh, affect change very quickly. And the other part is also people started getting perspective about events in other parts of Africa, where the newly decolonized nations were more ahead in terms of development than Ethiopia. So people started asking that they need to get rid of this archaic system of feudalism or in their perception, uh, land reform, but these are things that you can't change overnight. I mean, in a traditional society, you cannot change things overnight. You have to uh, create the pace of change that, you know, at the same time creates stability. So what happened in Ethiopia was uh, really a catastrophic uh, revolution that, that really at its own bright people, the very people who were behind the revolution were the ones who were its, its victims. Mm. And it seems to me that Marxism at its core is a spiritual issue when we talk about these oh, things. Definitely. Then, I mean, Ethiopia is a nation country with, uh, it's a nation of faith and faiths uh, because, you know, Islam had its beginnings there, Judaism, also Christianity. And when a government came and there's no, and announces, officially proclaimed there is no God, of course it affected people. And uh, they closed all the churches. In fact, religious persecution was very rampant. 
uh, it didn't it didn't fare well for for the Marxists. I mean, they never got the support of the people because they wanted the god to be their government, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And exactly. it's interesting they have they have to sacrifice. They do their own sacrifice. So they sacrifice the Tsar of Russia and say there is no god, and we're going to kill the family that represents him, and we're going to do the same here with the emperor, uh, Haile right. Selassie, we're going to sacrifice him to our God, which is this communist state, isn't it? Right, right. And it's remarkable. I mean, when you see now, you know, you, li you live long enough and then when you witness what happened in Russia, you know, with the Tsar's, uh, you know, reburial, his remains, and now the rise of orthodoxy, you see that there is hope. There is a very much hope in Ethiopia and even today, uh, um, the people are very devout, devout in their own faiths. Uh, and it, it's as if that period of Marxism was just a fleeting thing, that it didn't really impinge or, you know, damage that long history connected the civilization and its connection to faith. What would you say to young African-Americans who are looking around and they're getting interested in Marxism and socialism and they're saying, I think this is the answer. I think this is where I'll find my liberation or my salvation or, you know, solve the problems that I want solved. What would you say to them, who, those younger generations? I think I, I would say to them that it's very interesting to read and to understand concepts. But when you live life and experience it, you realize how complex it is and it's not such a black and white issue. And that idealism, I think, leads to a lot of fanaticism. It's your way or the highway. And that has led to a lot of uh, problems, a, a, a lot of blind hatred, a lot of blind murders, a lot of blind, all, as you mentioned earlier, all about being the sacrificial lamb and to justify your right and that man is God and in charge of his own destiny, which I don't believe it. What do you think when you see these statues being torn down in America? Does this look familiar to you in history or? It does. It very much does. And it's a pity because recently this year we had uh, my great grandfather's statue and uh, my grandfather's statue destroyed one in Ethiopia and the other one in England. So this thing has has been amazing, just to observe. And yet, these people don't know what they're doing. These people do not know what they're doing. I mean, I will admit to you, I was very happy when they tore Lenin's statue uh, down in Addis in 1991. Uh, but you know, some in some sense, you know, history is history, and just because you destroy statues, it doesn't mean that it just uh, ends there. Very well said. And I think that's what you see with, they need a scapegoat, so they want to, you know, destroy these statues to try to represent a new world order emerging, but it doesn't work that way. No. You have to be able to be mindful of the fact that uh, if, you, if you're filled with self-righteousness, that doesn't end well for your cause, does it? You have to have the no. ability. <laughs> Absolutely. And you have to have a, a, an ability to to compromise and negotiate and come to terms, the ability to communicate. I mean, it remains even a challenge today in Ethiopia. It's like force is not going to be an answer. And it's very interesting how human nature never learns from that. When you said they don't know what they're doing, it reminds me of uh, what uh, our Lord Jesus Christ said when he was on the cross. He said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the posture that I guess God takes when he looks at humanity and we should take as well that so much of what we do in history is a bunch of mobs that don't know what they're doing, you know, right. filled right. with envy and fear and hate. Absolutely. Know? And the herd mentality. Yeah. You know, and the ignorance, people don't stop to think through things and they're just uh, led by, you know, very evil, corrupt. Uh, and I always say the vocal extremists, but they're the minority. They're not necessarily people who represent sort of universal values. 
you know, there's a growing movement uh, online of young people who are interested in monarchy. They want to return to it. They think that the systems we have today need correction. They need monarchy. And I don't know how that would work in America, of course, with our rebel base, you know, background. But, but I think about right. that. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Because there's a book by Hans Hermann Hoppe called Democracy, the God that Failed. And he compares monarchies versus public governments. And he looks at the total GDP expenditure of what a monarchy would take for the economy versus what public governments like democracies take. And it's just insanely different. You know, it's two to 3% monarchies on average, you know? And then, what, what was that? It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I didn't know the statistics. And then you see with uh, with democracies, 56% GDP is, is consumed by the government. So when you have, when because the way Hans Hermann Hoppe, the economist, describes it, he says a monarchy, they own the, the property that they're managing. So they have the long-term maintenance of the value of the property in mind. Mm -hmm. Just like it's a renter of a house versus an owner of a house, you know? Mm -hmm. So if an owner... It's a good comparison. Yeah, so when you're electing officials all the time, they're like renters. They're here for four or eight years or whatever, and their only concern is maximizing the short-term value of the assets that they're controlling. Right. They do not pass it down to their heirs. You know, Donald Trump does not pass, you know, the White House ownership to Ivanka. It doesn't work that right. way. So when you are renting power, you do not have that long-term value proposition in mind. And, it, and so even if you're very astute and very wise, a democratic system inevitably leads to kind of a public largesse and decay because there's not that long-term value uh, perspective that takes place when something is privately owned, you know? It's interesting uh, the way you've, you've, you've explained it. To me, what I find most interesting also, the, the economies that are doing so well, for instance, in uh, Northern Europe, et cetera, they're all constitutional monarchies. And a big factor of that, I think, is uh, the stability, the, the smooth transition of power, the, the as you said, the long-term vision, uh, definitely comes into play. And then when we talk of democracy, this is a challenge currently in Ethiopia. How do you define democracy? Do you define it in terms of ethnicity? Do you define it in terms of the majority or the minority? It's a very tricky subject and at that, a very expensive one. And I think it's a big challenge for most developing nations who are just struggling to continue, uh, you know, to develop. And yet, as you said, uh, in often the cases in under such systems, the rule of law goes out of the window and corrupt, corruption is rampant. Right, and that's one of the things that natural law is the idea that that law is based on things that are transcendent, not based on rule as you go, you make up as you go, right? Right. Yeah. Right. That's one of the things that we have in our country today is the, the doctrine of positivism, where there's not, nothing is based on what it actually is supposed to be, right or wrong. It's all about, well, whatever the last court said is true, that's what we'll say is true, too. You know, right. when, when, right. you have a, when you have a monarchic uh, rule that is honoring God, then you have timeless moral truths that cannot be legislated out of existence. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think the founders of our nation were trying to get at something like that, you know, the but idea of immutable truth. You know. It's important because when you see... When, when, when in effect, as you said, if, if you don't have uh, a system of law or something that you, you fear and man becomes the ultimate uh, dispenser of power, it comes with all the frailties of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the greed, the, the, the uh, limitations as human beings, the uh, the lack of reverence. So he sets an example for others, which is immoral, and it just continues to decay civilizations. And there's really also, to a large extent, uh, it also becomes a world uh, where there's less hope and less reflection. 
and everything is uh, incumbent about four year cycles. And uh, I think this pandemic has given us a lot of time to reconsider and think about a lot of things. And, you know, you realize ultimately we are not in charge and that little thing, I mean, look at, look at the COVID situation. It's really placed everybody under strict orders to lock down and expected that. And that is a great leveler for all the even presidents and so forth can get this virus and Equalizer, yeah. the great equalizer. Yeah. Well, I want to turn to more of the contemporary Ethiopian situation. What is the, uh, some of the pressing issues that Ethiopia is uh, dealing with at this time? Uh, I know that there is a, uh, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam project. That's been a big topic. Uh, can you shed some light into the, the current status of that project maybe? And Yeah, I, I think that this is, this is a, this is a project that Ethiopians feel ownership to because a lot of people uh, funded it through their own salaries. So everybody has a stake in that. And in essence, um, Ethiopia has, has been denied its sovereignty about its own assets and how to use them. And uh, the Egyptians have done a very massive campaign to discredit Ethiopia as the, a country that's not, you know, uh, has no reverence for international law. And yet I think um, Ethiopians have been very patient and they need to use their natural resources to grow, to develop as a nation. And they're trying to create a hydropower uh, by which they want to fuel industry and employ their people. We are now the second largest population in Africa with 110 million people. So we do need to develop. It's not even a luxury, it's a necessity for us. Mm -hmm. so this has been a problem. And um, what I see now that the negotiations uh, are going to be, how they're going to be conducted, how honestly they're going to be brokered is going to be a challenge. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, United States took the side of Egypt which I think is a great mistake. Uh, I think we need a neutral party uh, in any form of uh, negotiation. And the fact that the African new Union now has taken leadership probably will help, uh, uh, you know, level that playing field. And hopefully P uh, the United States and other governments around the world will support it because it's, uh, it's only equitable that it would be so. Uh, I mean, in every sense, uh, there's been an even support, blind support for Egypt all these years. Why is that? I think it's, it probably is for, for the larger geopolitical reasons and also that the, the Egyptians are very, uh, very able in how they lobby for their interests. And I think that's probably the old foreign policy of America. I think Trump wants to change that to be more neutral, stay out of people's affairs, it seems. I hope that. It, it, yeah, or, or if it's engaged, it should be on, on an equitable level. Right. It, equal. Yeah, because America, you know, the free world looks to America as, as a leadership um, uh, position, and it has. It's taken, it's changed the world. I think the technologies are here also going forward. So I think America has a lot of a role to play, positive role to play, but it has to play a balanced role. Well, of course, China has been influencing and getting involved in this region too, and, and has worked with different things with uh, Ethiopia. Can you shed a little light in that relationship? Yeah, the, the Chinese involvement is, is very interesting. Of course, the Chinese do everything for their own interests, but uh, for instance, when, when I say that, they are make loans available which have become a huge burden to us. But in actual fact also, they've built solid infra infrastructure on the ground. Uh, when you look at this, uh, the, the, the state of roads, uh, uh, bridges, uh, trains, uh, railway trams, they have transformed it. But unfortunately, it comes at a big price for Africa where we have to uh, sell in advance our minerals, our, our, our uh, you know, resources, natural resources, and at the same time, be burdened by such uh, incredible debt that it, 
it's very hard to sustain over the long term. So, I mean, it's in a, in a way in a new form of economic neocolonialism. So has, uh, has China's influence in Ethiopia, is that why America has moved on Egypt side more, or do you don't think that has a relate, that's not factored in? Um, well, I, 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 I think the United States also realizes its importance on the Horn of Africa. I mean, I don't think they're blind to it. And over the long term, I think the solution is cooperation than uh, confrontation. And both Egypt and Ethiopia have to come to a sensible, pragmatic solution where it's in the interest of every party because, you know, the global competitiveness uh, around the Red Sea, Suez Canal, uh, you know, where a lot of trade happens is going to be vital for the security uh, of the world generally. And everybody has to guarantee that's a stable area. Mm -hmm. Uh, the alternative is unthinkable. I mean, Ethiopia has gone through a series of wars the last uh, 45 years or so, and it's taken an unimaginable toll. And the number of refugees now all over the world, uh, you know, war only creates more problems. It doesn't solve anything. And speaking of that, there's also, I've heard, uh, the threat of a kind of Kosovo-type color revolution movement in the Tigray region, is that right, of Ethiopia? Well, you see, I mean, that goes back again to this concept of federalism or democracy or whatever, how you have enshrined the constitution that basically divides people in group lines. And when you do that, one group always feels they need to make an enemy of the other. And unfortunately, in Ethiopia's case, the victims had been Christians, the victims have been uh, certain ethnic groups uh, whose minority live in other parts of Ethiopia. And the sense that, you know, the time is, has come now for us and negating history that people want to take revenge. And this is totally unacceptable. Uh, because we cannot build a nation in, 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 in that, in that, in that uh, uh, way of thinking. So uh, I think that has to be a really a chat. Firstly, then we are going to have elections this year, which is a great thing. And once an elected government takes place, I think they'll take a more sober look as to as the, what are the underlying problems and how to tackle them going forward. So when you when you look at that situation and you and you see that there's ethnic divisions, how do you right. how do you unite people with a common vision so that they can put aside that tribalism and come together for a sustainable future? There's, there's been unfortunately the plague of Africa has been tribalism, uh, and it was played on also by the colonial powers. But now I think the only way forward is to have common economic interests whereby people realize the value of peace and stability. People have the ability to trade amongst each other, freedom of movement, have a somewhat of a common shared history and come to an understanding about it where it doesn't have to be winner, uh, you know, everything goes to the winner. And unless we develop that kind of thinking, it's a question of thinking, I think, uh, it'll be very hard. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, ed education will play a large part. A measured, measured leadership will play a part. And building institutions will play a part, whether it be in law, administration, that's so critical. Because Africa, unfortunately, has been ruled by personalities, not institutions. What are some industries that you're looking at that you think could be great uh, opportunities for wealth generation in Ethiopia that can unite people the way you're describing? Well, it, Ethiopia is very rich in terms of natural resources. Unfortunately, it's never had the peace, stability, and the technology to develop. Uh, I think agriculture has a lot of potential, uh, but we're still using, you know, biblical time technology to, to, to farm you know, where the world now is doing so many things in terms of advancement in agriculture. And I think that's our biggest natural resource. Uh, and 
it's been a start of feeding ourselves where we can actually become net exporters of uh, food if we know if we had the right formulas in place uh, i think uh, also developing you know gas and oil uh, are fantastic opportunities not only in ethiopia but all the borderline area and to somalia has huge uh, you know gas and oil reserve uh, but it needs stability to develop so um, I hope that there will be laws enacted, administration, and also the move away from the communist mentality uh, into more free market thinking, into more, uh, you know, capital uh, market uh, injection, foreign direct investment, because no government can sustain employment levels. And unless people have developed entrepreneurial skills, and use technology to trade amongst each other and get onto e-commerce, I think it's going to be very hard to depend on the government to solve all, your, all our problems, especially the, the way birth rates are increasing in Africa. Yeah, if you don't have real growth and materials, then it becomes a, a static pie and it becomes a zero-sum game where people look for blaming each other, right? Right. Absolutely. And, and, and the pie's growing, everybody can relax a little bit, right? Exactly, exactly. That's so important. So what, where, what do you see America's role in this? Should we be, how should we, uh, what, you know, what's the best uh, perspective for America to, uh, with Ethiopia? I, I, I think there's a great opportunity for Americans to engage in business, mm -hmm. to transfer uh, technology. I think, uh, it's not like Ethiopia is an unknown country for them. Uh, they had a military base in Ethiopia. They've shared common interests. They've been allies in wars, both in you know, World War II and in Korea. They have similar vision of faith and freedom, which I think is uh, <clears throat> something humanity cherishes and values. Uh, so I think Engagement is the key. Engagement and not to completely isolate oneself. And uh, because any problem anywhere in the world today becomes uh, a world problem, as we just witnessed with the COVID situation. You cannot be completely isolationist because one way or another, it will come back to bite you. So it's a measured approach of not interfering, but at the same time engaging, because ultimately you're also benefiting yourself. Where do you see your projects in the next, let's say, five years from now as the president of the Crown Council of Ethiopia? Uh, Prince Hermias, where, where's, your, where's the future look for your project? Well, I, I, I feel that our family can play a role in, 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 in somewhat uh, bringing peace, stability in Ethiopia, engaging in, in dialogue, engaging in interfaith, so many things that are needed at the core on the ground. So uh, what I'm hoping is on the one hand, that will be the, uh, the, the vision forward, but on the other also uh, to give people a sense of their history so that they have a direction for the future and also to promote private investment and initiative and uh, you know, uh, technology and become also engaged with the diaspora which has somewhat felt neither here nor there, but we now have a very able diaspora that has created wealth, that has created knowledge that could benefit the country. And that is not being, I think, maximally utilized by the government, that they, they, they can take Ethiopia to another level of development. How about the future of potable water? Yeah, I know you've been working in that space for some time, right? Definitely. I mean, it's sad. Uh, the health sector in Africa generally has been the one that's taken the toll, and we just started to recognize how much uh, we lack because it's not been a focus, and we only just realized it with the pandemic. But clean water in Ethiopia is so essential, and now the technology is so advanced in that way that... Uh, because it's the source of major illnesses in Ethiopia that, can, that, that are preventable, this has been a focus. It's just a matter of how to scale 
the production cost of filtration systems and etc to to build you know sustainable viable systems off grid uh, that can work to uh, to you know create better health uh, opportunities for Egypt, especially in the rural countryside where the majority of people live. And that's a that's a major major issue. A lot of folks and entrepreneurs have a lot of ideas to help make those technologies more and more efficient, right? Absolutely, yeah. and then it's encouraging. I mean, I, I follow it quite closely, and what I see is very very encouraging. Uh, it's just we pray that it comes to fruition quickly, and it could be scaled so that it's cost effective. Well, very good. I think it's very important that. You know, one of the things my friend Shannon uh, Braswell and I talk about a lot on, we do podcasts together. He's from Seattle, Washington. We talk about the importance of having proper role models. If we don't have role models that we can look to, the culture doesn't go anywhere. You know, if all of our role models, at least I'm just speaking in America, if they're just, you know, celebrities who are promoting decadence and nihilism, then you're not going to have a culture to keep and, and protect. Right. If we if we have role models who are gifted physicists and engineers and innovators and creators right. Right. and free market capitalists, you know, Nikola Tesla, those folks, Edison, if we sure. raise those people up, then the generations that come up will look at those and want to emulate them. And I think that's what we have to do for both America and Ethiopia, right? To have I agree them. with you. I agree with you because... Um, Believe you me, America was a role model for me growing up. I mean, I, I wanted to know what America was about because of Hollywood. And, uh, but as you said, if we elevate that level of separation from just simple celebrity to real industrialists, real hum- humanitarians, real philanthropists, it will create such a positive, uh, you know, um, such a positive ripple effect that it, it, it could inspire generations to come. And I think in America also, let's not forget the African-American descendants have a stake uh, on, the, on the continent, but they, they're ignorant about it. They need to learn about it and get, engage themselves with it. Similarly to other communities in America that have been, tap, you know, lived in tapestry format, but yet have continued to engage back with their home countries, I think as new generation of Ethiopian Americans come to be, and as the African American population grows, they need to learn about the continent and get further engaged with it. I think we see very minimal engagement. Very good. Do you have any personal projects that you're working on in the future? Well, absolutely. I love to see, um, you know, the promotion of culture and tourism in Ethiopia. Uh, I think that's one way of preserving Ethiopian culture and Ethiopian history, which is very rich. And Ethiopia offers a diversity of everything from uh, landscape to cultures to, you know, uh, history. And we have that uh, something we have underutilized. And I think it harkens back also to the relationship with the United States, which created uh, Ethiopian Airlines under my grandfather, which has become now the premier airways in, 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 in Africa. And that is an asset that I think in the future would bring a lot of dividends. I think one thing that needs to happen is a very good movie needs to be made about your family, a good Hollywood cinema that can tell people the history, the truth, you know. I agree. I agree. I agree a hundred percent with you. I, I, I think there's been a skewed uh, uh, view of uh, the history, and uh, I think that 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 needs to change because I, I think there's an ins- an inspirational story there, and uh, unfortunately, you know, books like *The Emperor* by Kapuscinski have always tried to tame the image of the the emperor. Uh, to make him look decadent, but mm. it's absolutely not the case. The emperor was a devout Christian who firmly believed in his mission, and uh, I think he served a good part of his life, I mean, 60, 70 years in service of his people. And to end up the way he did, is, uh, I think it, uh, it speaks volumes to the tragedy of Ethiopia. 
And that story needs to be told, especially now in this moment where even America is starting to be tempted by socialism. That story needs to be told so that history can be correctly, uh, you know, understood so we don't repeat the same mistakes. That right. uh, Emperor right. Haile Selassie was a liberator of Africa and to be treated by those wicked uh, Marxists the way he was needs to be remembered by history so that I agree. we don't allow I those... They, they want to keep that record going, you know. Absolutely, I agree with you. And the nice part of it is the new leadership in, in Ethiopia and the new generation of Ethiopians are at least having a more balanced perspective on, on history, are having discussions on it, are having a different outlook rather than being indoctrinated. And that's what we need to get away from. And I think the, the part of the, the, the evil of uh, communism has been indoctrination. Well, Prince Ermias, Sali Selassie, it's been a real honor to speak with you. It's been a very informative discussion. We covered a lot of topics, as we said we did. would. We and, did, uh, David. Any closing, thoughts you, any closing thoughts you'd like to give to our audience, just speaking to the world, whoever's listening? Well, absolutely. I think uh, it's important for all of us to remain engaged in world affairs, in, as well as our own communities. After all, we're not all that dissimilar. We all have hopes for a better future for our children, uh, about our environment, about our collective uh, peace and state of mind and spirituality. So I hope uh, this is a time of reflection where we can go back to ourselves and engage further with one another as human beings first. Well, very good. A great message. So thank you once again. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate it.